let's finish up this Chem 105 experience uh, with our last little bit here on transmutation reactions and nuclear chemistry. And so we're gonna to start today with an example. We've got radon that decays with the loss of an alpha particle. What is the balanced equation for this decay? And then a secondary question, what is the product nuclide formed by the beta decay of tritium? So once again, the way that we start this is we have to start with our parent nucleus, which this would be radon-222. Radon is Rn. And we know the mass number is 222. Periodic table tells us that the atomic number here is 86. Now, this is an alpha decay. So an alpha decay is going to produce an alpha particle, 4,2-alpha. And all that we have to do to balance this thing out is we have to remember that the mass numbers on top have to be even on both sides, and the atomic numbers on the bottom have to be even on both sides as well. So if the total needs to be 222, I've already got four. 222 minus four gives me a mass number of 218. Total has to be 86. I already have two. 86 minus two is 84. I look to the periodic table. Periodic table tells me that element number 84 is polonium. EO. So that's the first example. Let's look at the second one. Here we are talking about tritium. Now I briefly mentioned on Wednesday the three different nuclear forms of hydrogen. There's hydrogen, the one that we're most familiar with, H1. There's deuterium, the one in the middle, H2. And then there's tritium, H3. Tritium, H3, is going to look like this. It's hydrogen with a proton and two neutrons. Now we're told it goes through a beta decay. The beta particle would be no mass, negative one charge, beta. So there's my beta particle. Now I need to figure out what is the daughter nucleus? What is the product nuclei here? Well, total mass is three. I've got zero already. So three minus zero is three. Total proton is one. I've got a negative charge here. One minus negative one. Opposite of a negative is a positive. One plus one is two. Element number two is helium. Any questions with these two nuclear examples? All right, you know what time it is then. It's time for you to start doing this on your own. Balance this nuclear equation. Actinium-222 decays into francium-218 and what? So fill in the three blanks on your top hat response now. All right, so what we need for this is we do need a context for the two elements. So actinium is element number 89. 
and creatine is element number 87. So if we're trying to figure out what's missing, again, thinking about conservation, the total is 222. I already have 218. 222 minus 218 is 4. 89 minus 87 is 2. Now there's two ways that you can go with this. You can either put in the Greek letter alpha, which if you um, look, there was a submenu uh, that you could have chosen aside from the, the numbers. Or you could have put in the elemental symbol helium because that is correct also. Now, just as a word of caution, we did find this out. Uh, a couple of people texted me about it uh, as they were working on these assignments. Generally, smart work is looking for the Greek letter. So if you have alpha decay or beta decay, positron emission, it's going to look for that Greek letter as opposed to E for electron or helium for alpha. So just be, just be advised of that. Now me, personally, there's really not a difference between the two. I'm a, lot, a whole lot less picky about it. And I think that should be reflected in whether or not your answer was marked correct. Um, all right, let's take a look at another example. I've got vanadium-47 turning into titanium-47. How did it do it? All right, approach is about the same. We need to know what vanadium is. Vanadium is element number 23. We need to know what titanium is, element number 22. The only real difference here between this kind of problem and the other kinds is that the approach is basically reversed. Instead of us trying to figure out what is over here and match it to over here, since there's only one product in multiple reactants, we just need to match up to the product. So 47 is the max number. That's also the number on the vanadium, so we know we have zero mass. 22 minus 23 gives us a negative one as the charge. We can either call that an electron, or um, that's probably the, the most accurate one. This is uh, electron capture. If this was happening on the other side, we would call that beta decay. All right, any questions related to transmutation reactions and um, you know solving these nuclear equations? Okay, so. Um, this one is a little bit more complex. Um, what we have to recognize, so we are bombarding plutonium 239 with alpha particles. So on this side of the equation, we have plutonium and we have an alpha particle colliding. And on the other side, we're going to make curium 241. So going to the periodic table, we see that plutonium is element number 94 and curium is element number 96. Um, by the way, this is one of the means that we use. If you've ever wondered, how we got most of the transuranium elements, all the ones after uranium, the ones that are not naturally found at all. 
this is one of the ways that they do it. They, they basically smash small nuclei into each other and see how they stick together. And if they can stick together long enough to form a stable new isotope, or at least stable enough that it hangs around long enough for us to realize that it is different, that is how we discover new elements. That's how we got all the way to element 118, even if our periodic table doesn't show it, the ones that we gave you do. So the question before us is, well, what's missing? So if I do this reaction, I can see I've got 243 as my mass number total, 239 plus four. The curium only accounts for 241. So I end up having an extra of two here. On the bottom side, 94 plus two gives me 96. That matches the 96 of curium. So there's no atomic number there. So I've got something that is chargeless, yet has a mass. And so what we have to think about is what are the things that are without charge that we know of? There should be one thing that comes to mind, hopefully close to immediately. A neutron. A neutron has mass, but no charge. Now the problem is a neutron has a mass of one with no charge. So this is where some of that chemical intuition has to come in. And we, we recognize, okay, it's not two zero it's two neutrons. That's gonna give us the way to balance this equation. So when this bombardment occurs, two of the protons and two of the neutrons stick to the plutonium and make curium. The other, two pro, the other two neutrons basically get left behind. And I'm hoping that I look smart here and it's telling me that's what happened. Okay, so sometimes these nuclear equations do get a little bit more complicated than what we have been showing. Now, the good news for us is that as far as nuclear chem is concerned on the final exam, they're not going to get this way. Um, it's gonna stay largely in the hash marks that we've been talking about. Um, but you do understand that, you know, we can take this multiple directions. You can actually use these kinds of equations to describe what's going on inside of stars or what's going on inside of a nuclear power plant when we break apart that nucleus and get all the energy from it. Or, you know, in fusion processes that are not associated with stars. If I put this, L, this isotope together with this isotope and they come together and make this isotope, there's gonna be some extra particles left behind and transmutation reactions can help you to figure out what those extra particles are. So yeah, this one's a little bit tricky. Um, honestly, the reason I put it in there was more along on our older final exam there was a question that was more like this. And so it was a preparation kind of thing, getting you ready for the, what we, when we used to do a written final, um, kind of like what I'm giving you as extra practice problems. Um, so that's why that one was in there. That's why I chose it specifically for that time. All right, any other questions related to transmutation?
All right, so let's move on to closing up this part of the chapter that we need to. Um, so we've got two other concepts that we need to uncover um, to get us ready for the final. One of them is the idea of rate of decay. Now, when it comes to rates of decay, what we usually talk about in terms of radioactive materials is something called the half-life. Half-life is just simply how long does it take for half of the material to decay? So if I've got a radioactive isotope of uranium, let's say I have 100 grams of it, the half-life would be how long does it take to turn that 100 grams into 50 grams? And then how long does it take to turn the 50 grams into 25 grams? And the 25 grams into 12 and a half, and so on and so on and so on. Now, the really cool thing about radioactive reactions is that those half-lives are consistent, which makes them really easy to calculate time intervals. For those of you that move on to Chem 106, this is called a first-order reaction. That's one of the hallmarks of a first-order reaction. Other kinds of reactions don't obey this. Their rates of decay are often associated with how much stuff there is. So from that standpoint, we can actually figure out, based on radioactive decay, how long stuff's been around. And we can do it by simply cutting in half the number of, of if we look at how long the half-life is and how many times the original sample has been cut in half, we can multiply that half-life, whatever that time interval is, by the number of times the sample has been cut in half. The number of times it's been cut in half that's the number of half-lives that have elapsed. The length of time that is, well, that, that just depends on how long each half-life is. But again, the key here is consistency. If we're starting with 40 particles, the time that it takes for that 40 to shrink down to 20 is the same as the amount of time it takes that 20 to shrink down to 10. And it's the same as it takes that 10 to shrink down to 5. The half-life is consistent. Doesn't matter how much stuff there is, the half-life is going to be a constant value. Which makes it really useful things like radiometric dating. You ever wondered how an archaeologist can determine the age of a substance or how, you know, how this particular object is from, you know, such and such dynasty in ancient China versus such and such other dynasty in ancient China? Radiocarbon dating has a lot to do with it. Yes, they can look at the artifacts and try to match up the art and some of the other structures in terms of, oh, well, in this age, they made things this way. But radiocarbon dating is a really good way to do it as well, because it goes off the idea that carbon is the most abundant element in living things. You, know, you yourselves are made up of a carbon backbone of, of molecules. And so long as you are alive, your body is constantly interchanging those carbon atoms. You eat, you respirate, carbon goes in, carbon comes out. Well, what that means for you is that the relative number of carbon atoms in your body, in terms of percentage, is roughly the same. 
99% or so of the carbon in the universe is carbon-12. The other 1% is a mixture of carbon-13 and carbon-14. So we can look at carbon-14, which is the more abundant of the two, and know that its radioactive decay has a half-life of 5,730 years. And we can do some comparisons. Okay, living things have this much percent carbon-14 in their body. When that living thing dies, it no longer exchanges the carbons in their body. So the amount of carbon-14 in their body when they die is set. That's the maximum amount, whatever percentage of that 1% it is. Since they're no longer exchanging the carbons in their body, that 1% starts to decay, undergoes a beta decay to the stable nitrogen 14. Well, what we can do is using this equation and using the relative amounts of Here's how much carbon-14 should be there if it was alive. Here's how much carbon-14 is in there now. Half-life is 5,730 years. So solve the equation tells us this is how much time has passed since the object in question died. So for artifacts that are derived from natural sources, we can monitor that. For things that are not from natural sources, it's a little bit more difficult. But that's one of the techniques that is used in archeology span to try to figure out how old things are, try to figure out from where they came from and, and uh, a rough idea of their age. So as far as half-life is concerned, the things that we need to walk away with are, we need to walk away with the idea that the half-life is a consistent value, regardless of how much stuff we have. And we can use that idea to count how many half-lives have passed to give us an idea of how old something is. Now, the equation I just showed you here, that's irrelevant to us. We don't need to know that information. We don't need to know how to calculate that finely and precisely the age of something. That's a Chem 106 concept. The Chem 105 is really just about how many half-lives have passed. It's gonna be an exact number of half-lives. So if I tell you that you've got 100 grams of stuff and three half-lives have passed, you should be able to count it out. Okay, 100 to 50, 50 to 25, 25 to 12 and a half, there should be 12 and a half grams left. That's as far as we need to take it in this class. Again, next class, talking about kinetics, getting into the finer details of this stuff, you're going to need to know it a lot more firmly. Here, we're just kind of staying on the ground level. Last concept that we need to talk about is something called mass defect going to make you sound immediately smarter here in the last five minutes of this class. The idea of mass defect is relatively simple. If I take a look at a helium nucleus, by definition, it's mass is this bottom number, 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Well, what's funny about that is if I take the mass of the two protons, 
plus the two neutrons that went into it, we get 6.695 times 10 to the negative 27. So there's a slight difference in the mass between the mass of the particles individually and the mass of the nucleus itself. The question before us is, where does that mass go? And the answer also answers a question that might have come up to you from time to time during the course of the semester. How is it that the nucleus, which is composed of only positive particles with some neutral particles mixed in there as well, why doesn't it just repel itself? Why does the nucleus stay together? Those repulsion forces should be pretty strong, right? Well, the answer to both of those questions comes from this idea of mass defect. Because what happens is that this mass defect gets converted into energy. Now, we all know that equation on the screen. It's the, I can sound smart equation. Now we actually know what it means. E is equal to mc squared tells us the amount of energy that is released by the nucleus that holds together the nucleus and keeps all those particles tight together. That's what mass defect does. That little bit of mass gets converted into energy. And the energy that is created from that defect holds together that nucleus. We call it nuclear binding energy. Now, as you might expect, with C being the speed of light, the speed of light being a constant value, as you might expect, the bigger the nucleus is, the more binding energy it's going to need to draw itself together. <coughs> so if you think about where we were on Wednesday, looking at that stability path, that band of stability, the stable molecule or the stable nuclides needing more and more and more neutrons. Now we have another reason for why they need more and more and more of those neutrons. The more neutrons they add, the bigger the mass defect is going to be, the more energy that is going to be used to hug that nucleus together and keep all those protons and neutrons tight together. So this delta M, that mass defect, that is going to be proportional to the size of the molecule. And that's why, again, those small molecules going up to calcium can get by with pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. We don't need that much mass defect to hold them all together. But as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, we need more and more neutrons to pull together that nucleus. 